Welcome to the YouTube studio at the Munich Security Conference. I'm Dr. Adana Steinacker, and I am joined by an incredible woman, Honorable Boholo Kenawendo, <laughs> who currently serves as the Special Advisor and Africa Director to the United Nations Climate Change High Level Champions. So lovely to have you here, Honorable Kenawendo. Thank you very much for having me. Amazing. So you have had a very interesting and inspiring career and one that spans trade and investment, finance and development, public policy. And you also served as the Minister for Trade, Investment and Industry in Botswana. And I'm only 20 years old. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you know, and she's only 20. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, a fun fact, now that you mentioned it, a fun fact is during your time at, as minister, you were the youngest cabinet minister in all of Africa. Yes, yes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That is truly, truly impressive. So let's talk about your time here at the Munich Security Conference. You moderated a panel session on scaling up climate finance, right? So... In your experience, what are the most difficult, what are the challenges to mobilizing finance for, you know, climate? Yeah. What are the challenges for mobilizing climate finance in Africa? Right. First, I mean, what an honor uh, to uh, moderate a panel mm. uh, here yesterday with two women uh, that uh are not just leaders, but they are prime ministers, mm. you know. Um, and I was just uh, in awe uh, looking at my stage and thinking, first of all, I have a very gender balanced uh, panel. Yeah. And then two of them incredible. are prime ministers. Um, I love and Mia Motley from yes, Barbados. She's I mean, just truly incredible. Truly incredible. Yeah. So to have uh, both uh, uh, the prime ministers uh, deal with that subject matter of climate mm. finance is incredible. But also to specify specifically, since you're mentioning uh, Prime Minister Mia Motley, to specifically speak about uh, climate finance and the global financial infrastructure mm. and the challenges mm. of, uh, um, you know, mobilizing climate finance for yeah. developing uh, countries yeah. uh, with her in that stage um, is uh, one of those things that, you know, I think the world needs to hear mm. more. And I'm glad that uh, the Munich Security Conference created that platform. Yes, yeah. And um, to come back to your question, you know, we know these challenges. Mm. The first challenge is just access. Yeah. You know, it's, it's access. Where does the capital lie? Mm. Uh, we find that most of the capital still resides in the global north. Yeah. And uh, the access to the capital is very difficult and uh, it's very uh, timely. It's consuming yeah. to get to, uh, to the capital. Matter of fact, we even uh, wrote a paper to really describe these challenges of getting to the capital in the global north. Mm. And uh, some of those uh, challenges of getting there is once you approach is, oh, but... Um, it's too risky to give you this money. Oh. Um, yes, to invest in the continent is mm. too risky. Uh, your your credit worthiness uh, yeah. is questionable. And then, you know, we, we put the figures out there that actually investing, the default rates of investing in the continent, in Africa in particular, yeah. are not as high as you think they are. They're not in, rather in the double digits as has been perceived. Mm. Um, and then you're stuck with, oh, um, but uh, what projects are there? The, there are no climate action projects. And then you show the projects. So there are many, yeah. several layers. And I think at the bottom of it is bias. Yeah. Even I though think, the data shows yes, that the global the, south is more yes. affected by the impacts of climate So I can uh, yeah. outline the different challenges that exist. Yeah. But at the core of it, I'd say it's bias. Mm. And um, the bias is the one that has stimulated the conversation around the need for a global financial infrastructure reform mm. that starts with the 
multilateral development banks, and then that will go cross-cutting into the development uh, financial institutions that are owned by uh, the Global North uh, government, mm. and then going into the private sector yeah. to make sure that it's a systemic approach uh, and an overhaul that recognizes that development and climate change are the core issues that we need to deal with in this current generation. Yeah, and actually as a segue into the next conversation, you talked about the private sector, mm. right? So how could they be more effectively engaged in, in climate financing initiatives then? Yeah, I mean, one of the issues we've been looking at is just the structuring of... Um, of our uh, national, nationally determined contributions. The reason why I pause is mm -hmm. usually we toss out acronyms, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we toss out acronyms. We start saying NDCs yeah. and assume that everybody knows. No, okay. um, but I, I want to make sure that for those that are not in the climate space, they're brought in. Mm -hmm. And what, what these are is uh, um, in the climate space, you have countries, they set out uh, what their needs are in order for them to uh, reach... Uh, to contribute to us reaching the Paris Agreement. Mm. So um, what does my just uh, transition look like mm. and how do I build out this program uh, and this plan for me to get there? So yeah. uh, what are my energy needs for me to get there? Mm. You know, what are my water needs for me to get there? How do I decarbonize for me to get there? Mm. Like that, that, yeah. that is what, it, what that is. And for most developing countries, that can also be seen as an investment plan okay but the way it's packaged it isn't it doesn't speak to the private sector mm. and the way that a uh, transparency framework was originally crafted it really left out communication to the private sector okay. so um the way the projects are tailored it doesn't bring in the private sector okay. so it's very critical that we change that transparency framework as the countries are submitting the NDCs next year, uh, that they really tailor them in line with the expectation of the private sector and private capital to mm. really ensure uh, that uh, we can start to work on issues of credit enhancement yeah. and um, unlocking uh, private capital. And while we're talking about unlocking private capital, how do we also use public capital mm. to um, crowd in private sector? you know, okay. uh, to cheapen, okay. to cheapen yeah, capital. To subsidize, yes, yeah. to subsidize. Okay. And, and uh, you know, changing that framework to almost bring in and communicate with the private sector, is that something that you do in your capacity as a as an advisor to the high-level right. high champions for climate change? So that's one of the things we've been doing. Um, our role has uh, really been to mobilize non-state actors mm. into the process um, for them to set uh, ambitions, very ambitious targets of uh, both uh, decarbonizing, but being involved in adaptation and resilience mm. and just seeing themselves as part of this very uh, ambitious green growth story, particularly yeah. for developing markets, because but for it's, the world, you mean, for, because it benefits yeah. all of us at the yeah. end of the day. It does. But, but I say for developing markets in particular, because you know, for Africa, it's not a story of decarbonization necessarily. <laughs> It's not a decarbonization. Yeah. It's, it's a story of how do you grow in a green manner? Mm. You know, mm. how do you sidestep some of those traditionally um, heavy, dirty industries? That we're dependent. That dependent we're dependent, right? Yeah. Um, but it's still ensure that this development, this food... And the sustainable livelihood. Mm. And this is a very key issue for developing markets that the transition does not I'm leave anybody behind. Yeah. And, and that climate action, even at the global space, if in negotiations, does not remove that aspect of development, that they yeah. are part and parcel. Climate action is an imperative of development. And, and so, okay, so let's talk about even trade and investment. Uh, in, in Africa, how, how is climate change impacting that? Like, so trade and investment, that, I mean, because the conversation of mobilizing climate finance, we're talking about 
specifically the effects of climate change. Yeah. But then let's talk about already existing trade and investment in Africa. Is there is there an is there an overlap between the, the both? Yes. That's I, very I, see I yeah, there is. Um that's a whole other uh, can, a, of worms. can of worms. They're, okay. they're, but, but I'm happy to respond. Um, I, I like it because it's one of those issues that's uh, really engaged in. And I was mm. really happy that COP28 uh, mm. created a, a trade specific yeah. day so we can really get into uh, the nitty gritties of it. And um, we've been particularly concerned about um, how climate policy is also thinly veiled as trade policy mm. or the implications of having climate policy, um, implications of climate policy on trade policy. Mm. And I'll give mm. you an example of uh, EU CBAM uh, on uh, uh, trade uh, and industrialization mm. uh, in the continent. You know, what's, what's going to happen to um, uh, some of uh, maybe nuts and bolts that are uh, created in, um, that are manufactured in uh, Mozambique and mm. in South Africa, you know, um, are those additional non-tariff barriers, how do you deal with them? Do we need to go back to the negotiation of the uh, economic partnership agreements with those already embedded Embedded in the agreement. And mm. these are some of the things that if uh, the EU CBAM is not uh, fully consulted with um, our trade policy yeah. uh, experts, then it seems like it's a messy process. Yeah. And, and, and um, it takes us back to, you might recall uh, when um, uh, the US introduced IRA. Uh, the EU, um, uh, the um, uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Okay. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, when they introduced uh, uh, IRA, um, the EU wrote and said, oh, this has implications on our trade. Mm. You know, you might need to roll back on some of uh, uh, your subsidies. And they did, but it's because climate policy or your domestic policy yeah. sometimes has an inadvertent implication right, yeah. and effect um, on external trade policy yeah. elsewhere. And it's important that there be the necessary consultation. Yeah. And we've really been so consistent with that the EU CBAM and any other climate policy, mm. because there's been such a rapid increase of climate policy, should be fully consulted with all the necessary stakeholders, yeah. because the implications are vast. Very, yeah. And it's not just the implications of trade, it's the implications on livelihoods, sustainable livelihoods, in particular because we are in this decade of yeah. rolling out SDGs. Yeah, and how it affects individual people. Yes. So no, I'm not, I was not, I'm not familiar with when the US rolled that out because trade and investment is, is, is not my, my industry, mm. but the purpose of even inviting leaders like yourself into the, the MSC studio is to bring this information, this education, this awareness yes. to the younger generation who might not understand CBAM and all of the acronyms yes. that, that yes. we throw around. Yes. <laughs> but, but, you know, if, if I may quickly just give an example of um, on in the investment side, because I yeah. mentioned trade. On the investment side, um, I think we're seeing something really interesting. We keep seeing these cycles of mm. investment, of protectionist uh, uh, policies uh, happening. And I feel like we're in another cycle of uh, investment uh, protectionist uh, um, one, uh, but using climate uh, mm. as a shield, oh. uh, climate policy mm. uh, as a shield. Um, with the IRA uh, subsidies uh, happening in, in, uh, in the US, you know, companies are incentivized to want to be in the US, you mm. know, if they're okay, in yeah. renewables. Mm. And we're seeing some of those companies relocating. So you're actively having a redeployment of investment, jobs and opportunities. Back to the global north, yeah. Back to the global north. Yeah, yeah. So we have used domestic policy and climate policy to redeploy investment and development from global south, yeah. while at the same time we're busy saying that 
what we are doing yeah. is a redistribution and democratizing trade and investment. I find this quite interesting. Was, was this touched upon in the in the panel yesterday? Not in the panel okay. yesterday, but there have been several closed door meetings. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure many more to come out of this, yes. of course. Yes. So I'd like to touch on female empowerment and gender equality because yeah. you served the G7 Gender Equality Advisory Council. What do you see is the biggest barriers to female leadership in, in your line of work, whether trade, finance, climate change sectors? What, what is the barrier? I mean, you are a, a, a woman leader yes. and there is not a lot of you. Yes. So what, is, what are the biggest barriers that you see from a gender equality perspective in your sector? You know, it's like um, biggest barrier is very difficult to mention because there are so many, okay. you know. I, and um, I, again, I think access is just always that number one, mm. you know, coming into spaces like these yeah. is always just so difficult uh, to get into traditionally male Dominated dominated spaces, uh, yeah. spaces that are, um, like security, um, and, um, legislation. Yeah. Okay. I was actually going to come to that. Do you, what, what policies? Le yeah, legislation. Yeah. yeah. Oh, honestly, legislation, um, at home that in one way or another limits your participation in society or economy mm. will also limit your role in leadership. Exactly. Yeah. If you can't own land, if you can't drive, if you can't work, yeah. if you can't inherit, no matter how small you think legislation, a piece of legislation is, any restriction that impacts a woman will impact okay. their role in, in leadership. leadership. Wow. Wow. Okay. And so, well, we need to, we need to do more. Yes. We need to do so, more. We need to change that. So if you want to think about what a challenge could be mm. for women in leadership in your country, do, yeah. do a quick scan of, is it hard um, for a woman to, to, walk, to walk in and, your street yeah. at night? If it's not, then okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, yeah. uh, it, it, for us, it was uh, till recently that uh, a woman couldn't inherit um, from their father. And that's a problem. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Wow. Okay. And so we know that these sort of legislative um, changes are key to supporting women. Exactly. In participation in the economy. Yes. Um, yes, financial to independence. Campaign, yeah. To campaign, you need, you need to be financially independent. Exactly. You know, yeah. to have a strong voice. To come to Munich, you need to be financially independent. Yeah. But also, let's not also underestimate the the, the power of seeing, of representation. Absolutely. Meaning that the fact that you are one of the women who have gotten here, I know without a shred of a doubt that you're inspiring young, future um, female leaders in, in Botswana. So well done. Thank you Thank for you the, the work much. that you're doing. And it's lovely to have you here in the studio. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. Thank you.